Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the second session on day three of the 11th annual Canadian Restaurant Investment and Leadership Summit, M&A, Finance and Capital Discussion. Uh, for those of you joining us again, welcome back. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Dimitri Mazur. I'm with CWB Franchise Finance, your host for the summit, and I'll be your virtual MC for today. A couple of reminders before we begin this panel discussion. We have 45 minutes booked for today's M&A Finance and Capital panel discussion. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions throughout today's presentation by typing your questions into the Q&A area on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and we will address these at the end of the discussion or follow up with you uh, directly after. The session is being recorded uh, and the link will be sent out to you next week. Um, and we will be sending out actually an email later this afternoon with a link to provide you, uh, to provide your feedback on today's session. We do appreciate you taking about 30 seconds to provide uh, your feedback as it does help us uh, shape uh, events in the future. Uh, once again, uh, I'm gonna take a brief moment to, uh, to thank all our sponsors for their support and participation in the summit. Uh, we definitely will not be able to put on such a show without their involvement and support. And now let's uh, not waste any time and get right into our panel on M&A finance and capital. Mergers and acquisitions uh, have been a growing topic of conversation in the Canadian restaurant industry for many years now, uh, but the challenges and opportunities of the last 18 months have given new life uh, to these discussions. Uh, whether a buyer or a seller, uh, brand owners have been given the opportunity to explore new growth, consolidation and diversification strategies uh, in a market environment that has never been uh, seen before in Canada. Joining us today is a group of advisors, lenders, and brand owners to discuss the current activity and opportunities. Uh, a big thank you to this session's uh, sponsor, Castles. I will now flip it over to today's moderator, Mickey Lungu of Castles, Brock, and Blackwell, to introduce today's panelists and lead the discussion. Over to you, Mickey, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the M&A Finance and Capital Panel. By way of introduction, my name is Mickey Lungu. I'm a lawyer, a partner in the business law group, Castles, Brock, and Blackwell, but I'm also part of the franchise group and hospitality group. Castles is a full service business law firm with offices in Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver, and our franchise and hospitality areas are leaders in the respective areas. So as Dimitri noted, we have a really exciting panel lined up today. We're really looking forward to getting into it. I mean, I don't think it's been a conference in 2021 without saying that it's been an interesting and dynamic last 18 months generally. And that is certainly the case with the hospitality industry, restaurants, and M&A at large. So we're gonna do a deep dive into the intersection of restaurants, M&A, and financing. We're gonna cover a ton of ground in the next little while. We'll start with an overview of where we stand today in the M&A and financing marketplace. We'll get a sense of the trials and tribulations of doing deals now, the left turn, the right turns, the ups and downs. We'll discuss creating value for a business or what capital providers and capital allocators consider value. Then we'll end off with an exploration of the panel's thoughts and where we go from here into 2022 and beyond. This will all be followed by a Q&A period, as Dimitri noted, so we encourage you to submit your questions. So without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start with an intro from the panel. Steve, can you kick us off, followed by Trish and then Paul? Happy to, thank you, Mickey. Uh, yeah, my name is Steve Pelton. I'm the president and CEO of Aegis Brands, Inc. Um, long time restaurateur, started a, a company back in 2008 with some partners of mine where we started uh, buying and building restaurants. Sold that company called The Landing Group in 2014 to uh, then called Kara, now called Recipe. I joined the team at Recipe, the executive team, and uh, you know ran the Milestones brand, ran the Landing brand, and a little bit towards then I, I was part of the beer market as well. 2019, I left uh, Recipe and and became the president and CEO of Aegis. At the time, it was called Second Cup, uh, and we joined. I joined this company really because um, I really love the brand Second Cup, but we also really love the idea of consolidating. Um, brands and, and using our infrastructure to do so. So fast forward to uh, late in the year 2021 and we've been through a pandemic and there's been a name change and, and we're back at the consolidation team. I think I'm next. Uh, hi, good afternoon everybody. Um, I'm uh, Trish Hollowell, uh, Senior Manager of Restaurant Finance with CWB. 
Uh, so I'm specialized in lending to the restaurant sector across Canada, uh, whether that be uh, larger corporate groups, franchisors, or individual operators of uh, restaurant locations. And I've been doing this for about 20 years in one way or another for uh, CWB and our uh, predecessor company, GE. Hi, everybody. Uh, Paul Hamam. Uh, I'm a partner at Deloitte. Uh, you know, I'm sure most of you know Deloitte as a global professional services firm, you know, that does virtually everything you can think of. Um, I'm part of a, a group, a very specific group at Deloitte called Deloitte Corporate Finance. Um, easiest way to think of what we do is we are the middle market private business investment banking team. So we do three, three, three things really well, or at least we think we do them really well. <laughs> One is we run the process of selling a business. Um, we help privately owned businesses with raising capital, uh, whether that's debt or equity capital or some combination of the two. And third, we also advise um, privately owned businesses who don't necessarily have the wherewithal or capability or experience making acquisitions on, on making acquisitions. Uh, just very quickly, a little bit on our team. We're, we're a team of about 75 people across the country. Um, in this. The second part might be surprising to people. We close more deals than any other investment bank in Canada, and that includes sort of the big four accounting firms, it includes the banks. Um, so that actually, you know, and so that makes us the largest investment bank in terms of deal volume. But what's more relevant, I think, is that 100% of those deals are, like I said, a middle market, privately owned businesses. So uh, large public market transactions, you know, oftentimes family, privately owned businesses. Uh, the reason I'm here is I, I lead our food and beverage um, M&A team which means I spend exclusively all my time focused on, on uh, putting together deals in the food and beverage industry and obviously food service and restaurants are a key component of that. I've uh, been in this line of work for 15 years and uh, you're really happy to be here uh, to share some, uh, some experience. Oh, it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a COVID conference if you were Somebody didn't say you're on mute, Nikki. Yeah, mute. And I'm kind of <laughs> guilty as charged. Um, so then I, I was just saying, Paul, that sounded all great. Uh, <laughs> and everybody, thank you for that. So let's let's start by getting a macro sense where we are in the M&A marketplace overall, how it looks for the restaurant industry currently, and then you know, maybe just some flavor of where we're going to touch more on this later on, but where things are going and. 2020 or 2022. So, Paul, maybe I'll start with you. Can you, can you lead us with an overview of that? Yeah, and, you know, if it's okay, I'll, I'll kind of start a little bit macro and and just and then we'll get a bit more specific. But I'll, I'll try to be brief. Like the, the way I like to think of this, and it's a question you can appreciate. We get asked all the time, and um, the way I the way I like to answer it is to look at the buyer universe. So, what's going on in the in the buyer universe? Because buyer activity is what's going to dictate M and A activity. And you know, there's really two categories of buyers. There's financial sponsors, which most people just refer to as private equity, and, and there's strategic buyers. So in this case would be you know, large industry players, multi-brand platforms like the best piece of the world. Um, so if you start, if you think about what's going on in the private equity markets, um, I'll, I'll share just a really quick stat. What's happened in the last 10 years is honestly shocking a little bit. There, there's now $2.5 trillion in North America of committed private equity capital. So that is, that is capital that has been raised and committed and earmarked for investment in privately owned businesses. And so that's a big number, but what's more relevant is that number doubled in the last 10 years. And so if you just think of it fundamentally, you've got more capital to be invested, um, but I can assure you there isn't double the businesses available for sale. So you've got this, you've got this sort of increasing pool of capital looking for a home. Um, and that's creating, you know, you know, aggressive buying behavior amongst, you know, the private equity markets. And then you've got the strategic buyers, which, you know, generally have been steady acquirers of businesses for the last 10 years. For the most part, their balance sheets remain pretty strong um, in spite of sort of some of the challenges that they faced in the pandemic. That said, you know, certainly in the restaurant space, but just even generally, what we've seen is a lot of them have been just inwardly focused and, you know, preoccupied with their own operational challenges lately. So that's tempered their, their, their I mean, activity a little bit, but we're starting to see that change. And so, you know, I say all that, what does that mean? Like, you know, we study deal volumes all the time. Um, and when I look at the food and beverage M&A uh, market in North America, Q3, which we just sort of wrapped up a month ago, deal volumes are more or less 
kind of in line um, with Q3 of 2020, so last year, but quite a bit below where they were in Q3 of 2020, 2019, so sort of pre-pandemic levels. But if you take a closer look at that, and I said food and beverage broadly, so that would include food, process, food processing and others, almost 100% of that shortfall is driven by, you know, reduction in M&A activity in the restaurant sector, about 50% drop off in M&A activity in the restaurant sector. So, you know, so I started out by saying there's so much capital in the market, strategic buyers should be hungry. Um, so, you know, why is M&A volume down in the restaurant sector? We'll talk more about it, but fundamentally, you know, I, like I said, strategic buyers have until more recently been fairly distracted um, with their own operational challenges. And all that private equity capital that's looking to, to make uh, an investment, um, they're trying to get deals in the restaurant space. And I'm sure Steve will speak a little bit more about this, but there's so much noise in the financial results um, that sometimes bridging the gap between value expectations and of, of the seller against those of the buyer just creates challenges in deal making and timing issues. And so sellers aren't desperate to sell. And in a lot of cases are just waiting to prove it out. Um, and so, so all in all, that's sort of, that's, I think that's, what's been tempering and some of that's anecdotal, but that's what's sort of been tempering the, the activity. And so, you know, what, what do I think is to come? I mean, I, I think most people will tell you that 2022 or Q4 of this year in 2022 with the world, you know, returning to normal, uh, there's no doubt there's pent up demand for M&A activity and consolidation in the space. And, um, and, you know, I think you're going to see a surge of that, um, in the coming year and, and potentially years ahead. Off mute now. Um, thanks, Paul. That was great. Um, so Paul's given us kind of a flavor on the M&A side. Um, Trish, on the lending side of the house, what's the landscape looking like? Well, uh, one thing's for sure, uh, the state of restaurant lending, it's definitely become more complicated. Uh, it, every business has a story to tell on what the impact of the pandemic has been. And there's pretty wide variation in results that we're seeing right across segments, across different provinces, even down to the specific location, uh, geographic factors that have determined whether or not the restaurant business is successful. Um, and so the state of restaurant financing right now is no longer one path for all. Um, there's really transactions that are gonna be easy to get done, uh, transactions that are gonna be very hard, or you know, maybe just have a mixed response from lenders based on you know, their own risk appetite or their experience with different brands uh, or operators over the past year. Um, so starting with the hard, uh, I think that's gonna be unfortunately the independence, um, mom and pop businesses, uh, emerging systems, uh, maybe some fine dining, anything with low unit count, um, we know that the independents have been devastated and, you know, the segment I think is still going to have a really tough time going forward. And, uh, you know, I know it wasn't easy before, uh, but I think unfortunately financing here is going to be a bit more difficult. Um, but the best bets for this group is going to be just to look at SBL facilities. Um, larger transactions may need personal assets, uh, such as real estate tied to a deal to make that happen. Uh, and of course, private equity, whether that be, you know, simple family, friends, uh, kind of capital or, or investors like Paul. Um, the easiest transactions to do right now are going to be in the QSR segment. So we saw that QSR was the quickest to bounce back and the recovery here has generally been strong, right? So some exceptions maybe with like uh, the urban areas or, or mall anchored uh, locations. Uh, but otherwise we're seeing most businesses now back to about a hundred percent and some even you know way higher right 10 15 percent up um, especially those lucky people that have drive-throughs um, now we were seeing positive same store sales trends in this group pre-pandemic um, and qsr has really done a good job of elevating food and uh, growth with third-party delivery apps has benefited them greatly so you know, going forward, I expect that banks are going to have a very healthy appetite for most QSR segments and lending should now be pretty much back to where we were in uh, pre pandemic times here. So, you know, where are you going to see some mixed appetites for financing? Um, casual dining is taking a bit longer to come back. Uh, summer has been great, but we'll see how comfortable consumers really are, you know, coming back in, in person over the winter. 
Uh, we know that most businesses are not back to full traffic, but um, operators here are super creative and we've been impressed to see so many new lines of revenue uh, you know, that didn't exist before, right? So these guys are, are doing the takeout delivery, meal kits, groceries, ghost kitchen concepts. Um, in yesterday's uh, CEO panel, uh, Ryan Moreno from GRG mentioned his, uh, his garden center pop-up in their parking lot. So there's lots of very cool adaptive things going on by FSR operators that are helping you know, bridge these times and bring more stability to their businesses. Um, so, you know, with this roller coaster ride that casual dining has experienced over these last 18 months, the financial statements here are going to be the most noisy, right? So structuring a transaction is a bit more complex, um, but lending, you know, I think is just going to be mixed now, depending on each bank's appetite, how things have worked out for them over the past year, and really the state of their portfolios. Um, you know, our view on this is that we're a lender that's in this for the long term, right? We, we want to support this sector, um, our clients and the relationships that we've built. And really, so as long as, you know, a business was in good standing pre-pandemic, there should be a way that we can make a, a new transaction work. Nikki, you're on mute. There. Okay, <laughs> time to turn. Now that we've just considered the world of M&A and financing for the restaurant sector at a macro level, interesting to go to the other end of the spectrum and get a sense of what's happening on the ground. And Steve, if you've sold the business and you've been looking to acquire a business in the last 18 months, can you give us a peek into the M&A world from this perspective and feel free to share how your particular investment criteria or thesis is impacting your approach. Yeah, thanks, Mickey. Um, it, you know, it's really interesting, and, it, and I'm not surprised at all to hear what Paul had to say about the, uh, the amount of deals getting done in, in this time compared to 2019 being our less. Because there's, there's a wide gap in um, people's perception. If you, if you even go back to what Trish said about the casual dining not being able to bounce back and the noise, you know, everyone talks about what it's going to be like when the pandemic's over. It's going to be this bonanza of people going out to eat and drink. And, and I don't think that that's necessarily false, but we keep waiting for that to happen and it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, a lot of people are saying, trust me, my company is worth what it more than it was worth in 2019 because I've found better ways to do business and more efficient ways. Just wait till all the sales come back in. And they just haven't in, in, in the casual dining space and probably not as much in the full dining uh high end space as well in quick serve it's on the other side of things it's had a really good run you know especially the the drive throughs and people that have been digitally enhanced one way or another through the pandemic and they've seen really great numbers and and they're not immune to seeing all the numbers of the publicly traded big boys south of the border and what they're trading at so especially in canada you know what people might be willing to pay for a company and what people are expecting to sell the company for, there seems to be a pretty big gap. Um, having said that, uh, there are a lot of conversations. I mean, there's people that we've spoken to that expected, uh, you know, just to have a conversation about maybe if they'd be willing to sell. And, and they tell me, well, actually I'm out there buying myself. And uh, so it, it's, it's quite interesting, um, you know, when I get to talk to somebody, a restaurateur, um, in this industry and just wondering what they're going to say either. Yes, I'm interested in selling. No, I'm not interested in selling. Or, hey, I've got three other people knocking on my door. Everyone is talking to everybody, but there seems to be a, a real big gap in, in valuations, uh, expectations from sellers to buyers, especially north of the border. Um, you know, the, the thing that all of us buyers, the, uh, you know, companies like mine or Private equity, or private equity or anyone else has to realize is the good brands, the really good brands, they're not going to come cheap even at the end of a, a century, a once in a century pandemic. It's, it's always a good brand is going to be a good brand and good entrepreneurs in those know that they can pivot and they can change and they had changed during the pandemic and they definitely don't want to discount. Um, some more challenged brands 
probably don't want a discount on the pandemic either because they all believe they're going to come back. And depending on who the, the seller is, if they got deep enough pockets, they'd rather wait for the rebound than sell at a discount. So these are all the kind of challenges on the ground level that I'm seeing as we talk to uh, several companies across the country on a, on a fairly regular basis. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, I'm sensing a theme, Steve and, and, and Trish and Paul, which is, you know, financials are challenging now. Like, well, interpreting a financial statement from the last 18, 24 months is, is, uh, is tough. And, you know, I think everyone kind of comes at it their own way. So I'm, I'm curious, Trish, how are you thinking about valuations from a capital provider landscape? Maybe you can take us through some tips for folks, you know, folks in the audience who, might be considering approaching an institutional lender such as CWB where their valuation may be questionable or their financials may kind of be a little noisy as you put it. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're very right. The valuations are going to be definitely more challenging these days. And really, no matter which segment you operate in, um, the financial statements for 2020 and 2021 now are going to be messy. So, you know, these months of lockdowns and dining restrictions have hurt everybody, regardless on, on which segment that they operate in. And really now, like supports via the, the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy appear to not just have uh, replaced the lost EBITDA, but in many cases they've overshot the need. So now we've got these really strange P&Ls where the EBITDA can now appear, you know, substantially above prior year levels. So, you know, I, either as an investor or a lending partner, underwriting a transaction at this point in time is not easy. Um, the simple model might be just to say, hey, let's look at the pre-pandemic 2018, 2019 results and assume a path back um, to this performance over the next year or two. Uh, but I don't know if that's like, that's not the most perfect method because so much has changed. Um, I, I think we should be considering the new lines of revenue, the new traffic generated, uh, more likely delivery uh, through all channels, um, and possible improvement in the competitive landscape. Um, we also, though, need to consider some escalations that we're going to see in COGS and labor as we're now dealing with price inflation and wage increases that, uh, that we're seeing to get employees back into the sector. Um, so overall, looking at the past results can help us with the baseline, but figuring out what the new normal is going to be um, requires getting a lot more granular um, on the analysis at this point. Um, our main tip for those seeking financing right now uh, would be to be uh, very current on your financials. So not just your fiscal year end statements, but even having monthly performance statistics. And, and help us by breaking down all of the, the subsidies and the deferrals that are present in the financials so that we can understand how this PL is now working and, and what we can uh, reasonably project uh, for this business going forward. Now, I can't speak for all banks, but in conjunction with all of this modeling, we, we are trying to build some more flexibility by, by stretching on leverage uh, for transactions or doing step-down covenants where it makes sense. And really, as long as we can map out a path to get back to kind of our normal lending ratios um, and ranges established, and, and then we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how that can be uh, accomplished. So all of that analysis is probably going to take a bit longer, um, but that is just going to be the way that we are going to determine the valuation of a business in this new environment and, uh, and help us be able to hopefully offer, you know, good and appropriate loan amounts and set covenants in a, in a fair and reasonable way. Great. Thanks, Trish. So I want to pick up on a through line that I think I've heard through a couple of comments here and there. It's, it seems to be a, a lot of potential, a lot that a potential seller can do in, in advance of seeking investment or having those conversations around whether it's debt to Trisha and Trisha's world or whether it's an equity type investment. Um, there seems to be some homework that potential uh, you know, sellers or let or borrowers can can do. So, you know, Paul, maybe you can take us into a uh, the room a little bit here. That's, that's your first phone call with a potential client looking to sell their business or get a capital investment. 
Is there anything you're asking them to do to get ready? Um, do you have a wish list of things your clients would have done before you spoke or before they get out to the market? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, he and it's, uh, you're right. I mean, it's one we get asked all the time. Um, I mean, we rarely show up on somebody's doorstep and, there's, and they say, hey, I want to sell my business. Let's go do it. It's, hey, I'm thinking about doing something. What should I be worrying about? What should I be thinking about? And, and, and honestly, it's like, you know, it's not, a, it's not a short conversation. It's a, you know, two, three hour conversation followed by many, many more conversations for months <laughs> leading up to a sale. But so what I'll, what I'll try to do, though, is I'll boil it down to what I really think fundamentally will drive a buyer's interest in your business and valuation of your business. And we've actually kind of put it into a bit of a framework to help you know clients think about it. But really, it, we, we look at two factors. Um, and before I get into those factors, like uh, the bottom line is the value of a business is driven by what somebody expects the future cash flow of that business to be. And so how do you approach, you know, um, giving somebody comfort that cash flow is going to be there and that it's going to grow. And so we look at two broad areas. We look at the quality of cash flow and we look at the growth potential of cash flow. So, you know, what do I mean when I say quality of cash flow? You know, just to give you a couple of examples, if you're a franchise system and you're the franchisor, you know, it might be that your, you know, your royalty stream has been strong um, and consistent and, you know, you've got, but things like COVID can have hidden impacts like impacting the underlying financial uh, condition of your franchisees. Um, so, you know, it's great that your royalties have been steady or, or expected to continue to be steady, but if they're all, if all your franchisees are in financial difficulty, somebody might question the quality of that cash flow. Will it still be there? Will it be sustainable in a couple of years from now? Just as an example. Like another might be is might be, hey, is your brand and your concept, you know, Steve mentioned, you know, the quality of your brand, you know, is it well aligned to consumer trends and consumer preferences? Or are you not well aligned? And as those consumer trends and preferences continue to move in a certain direction, is that going to impact the, the future cash flow of your business? Um, you know, and then there's something as simple as, you know, the underlying leases behind your units. You know, are they you know, are, are they high quality leases, low quality leases? Is there a limited term on them? Is there a demolition clause in it? Is there a redevelopment clause on them? That kind of stuff. You know, people like to look at EBITDA and say, hey, I should get a multiple of EBITDA. But all these little things underlying the quality of that EBITDA are, is the first question a buyer will ask. And it will dictate, are they interested in the business or are they not? And if they are, then it's, then it's about, okay, what's the growth profile, what's the growth potential of that cash flow, which is the second sort of framework. And so, you know, that is stuff as simple as, hey, what's your same store sales growth trend? What's it expected to continue to be? But more importantly, invariably what drives value in, in multi-unit businesses, whether it's restaurant or something else is, you know, what are the new unit economics like? If I put every, for every dollar I deploy to open a new store, what kind of return can I expect from that capital? You know, are there enough markets where this, where these strong, hopefully strong unit economics can be replicated or have you already tapped all those markets? Um, and do you have the overhead structure and management team and infrastructure to support scaling the business? So these are all, you, you put yourself, you start that discussion by putting yourself in the shoes of a buyer and, you know, answering questions around what is the qual, what are the things that impact the quality of my cash flow? What are the things that impact the growth profile of my cash flow? And that's what you, and, and then you realize where you have gaps and you almost got to go through it and give yourself a bit of a report card on, on those things. And, and where you have gaps, if you have time before you're looking to sell, you know, some of these things are things you can fix. Some of these things are things you can you know, focus on to improve before an exit. Um, but like I said at the beginning, like it, this is a case by case, very specific discussion. And it's not a simple discussion. It's actually a really complex discussion. And you know, the, the best thing you could do is sit down with an M&A advisor who is in the market selling businesses and knows what a buyer is looking for well in advance of you deciding to sell um, so that you have the time to make improvements and changes if, if it makes sense to. That's great, Paul. I think you missed the point where your potential clients should also speak to their lawyer before they're about to sell. You don't need the lawyers yet. <laughs> <laughs> a, a little self-plug there. Uh, no, that was great. And and we see that all the time, clients coming to us and say, you know, now what? What, are, what? what should I do? What's good? What's bad? You know, where, is, where do we need some fixing up? And I really do see a lot of value in the M&A advisors, to your point, who step in at that early stage and, uh, you know, point. It could be 
could be small. It doesn't have to be kind of a huge capital investment to make the big, big difference. Right. So, you know, and, and, you know, that's kind of a good segue into my next point, which is, you know, Steve, I know you're focused on the brand and we've heard that, you know, but I'm also you know, just anecdotally looking at it as a, as a marketplace. And I think a lot of operators over the last 18 months or so have tried to you know, maybe do some, some shifts to their business line. You know, QSR has been very successful for very various reasons. They're trying and other you know, parts of the marketplace are trying to pick up some of those um, some of those features. Maybe that's enhancing the digital profile, that's takeout windows and the like. I mean, from your perspective as a buyer, when you see that in a company, does that does that like does that provide real long term value in your view, or is it you know like a kind of like a you know, like a, a bit of a, a a pivot to address COVID realities. Like, how do you think about those types of you know, changes in, in businesses? Uh, yeah, great. Before I answer that, I'll just say, you know, the seller when they're thinking about calling Paul an M and A advisor or a lawyer, they should also call me a buyer. <laughs> uh, add on to that. Um, anyway, um, to answer your question, I think you know we all. It's been well documented. This this pandemic has forced. A lot of businesses and the restaurant, in particular, restaurant business in particular, to um, innovate at light speed. And a lot of these innovations, as we all know, again, has been well documented and well experienced by everyone listening. They're here to stay. In a lot of cases, more so in the in the quick service or casual dining space, less so in the truly experiential type, like fine dining or dinner and a show kind of things. They're they're not so much right, but with the Casual dining and quick service, they're, they're a must have. They really are because people have gotten used to cooking at home, although they don't like it and they can't wait to get back out and eat at restaurants or get takeout or whatever it might be, but they've gotten used to it. So the necessity of eating in a restaurant is, is quickly going away. Um, the reality is people have been long finding ways to uh, be more efficient with their time and more convenient um, in the things they do, um, even before the pandemic, like if anyone will remember, it's so long ago, it seems, but 2019 wasn't a stellar year for full service dining in North America because there's a lot of, you know, the emergence of the Uber Eats and the skip the dishes, et cetera, et cetera, um, had, had really taken a bite of because people had gotten used to eating at home. And then you, you layer on the pandemic effect where you're forced to, and, and you get used to it even more. Um, there has to be a digital tie-in uh, or innovation, not not only digital, but innovation that allows you to, to service people ways you weren't used to. And like I said, really QSR with curbside delivery and even FSR with, uh, you know, using your phone to, to get the bill and pay the bill and, and all things in between, they're not going to go away. And I think, like I said, the truly experiential places may not have to put it right now or as, as urgently, but everybody south of, of that kind of high level has to embrace it. They have to look at it and they have to be innovative. Again, if I could go back to shamelessly plugging Aegis, like we're really looking at, at great brands and great entrepreneurs. And when you think about great brands, great entrepreneurs, that they've, they have pivoted. They've figured out different ways to create business really awesome and innovative ways that would have probably taken 15 years to come see the light of the day if it wasn't for the pandemic. But because of necessity, these, uh, these really sharp people have figured out ways. I love like what they've done with, you know, delivering drinks to places and making those out of, out of uh, parking lots and, and everything in between. It's been really impressive. And like I said, I don't think it's going away when it comes to the digital and the convenience side of things that the consumers have, have become to expect. Yeah, and just quickly, Paul, going back to you on Steve's point, I mean, so we've come to expect that operators are putting some capex into it, and then, you know, like that capex doesn't get realized just yet in terms of the sale process. Like, is it in terms of you know that's still in the early days of the, the, the takeout offering or the digital enhancement, the, the meal kit still early days is picking up. Um, the ghost kitchen, whatever it might be, it's not yet built out, but you know, we've done it, we've gone there from a sale perspective and just want to get your quick thought on this. You know, do you wait to see how that plays out, see if it can drive some value to your, you know, your, your, your numbers ultimately stabilize your financials a little bit, or 
you just say, you know, it's it's there, it's got it, it's a good marketing piece for the for a potential buyer and see what you can do. Yeah, look, it, it's a, I'll, I know we're probably short on time, so I'll be brief, but the the short answer is, it's always better to prove something out than, than try to convince a buyer it's, it's on the cup. I mean, that's the reality. Um, but timing for selling your business is impacted by a lot more than just just that, right? Like there's there's things you can't control, like the state of the capital markets, for example. So, you know, I started out by talking about how the markets are frothy. There's a ton of capital looking for home, you know, that will increasingly uh, be available to restaurants and it's cheap. You know, all those things drive valuation and strong M&A markets. And so, you know, there's always this risk that you're trying to balance. And unless you have a crystal ball, you'll never know. But you're always trying to balance the idea of there's the next best thing. There's the next growth opportunity, whether it's a new delivery model or something else or opening the next location or whatever it is against. OK, so I'm going to deliver more EBITDA in two years from now against well, what if I lose that on the multiple because the capital markets turn against me. Right. And that happens. I mean, we live in a world where this cannot be sustained forever. And so you, you, you have to find a way to thread the needle. And, you know, what, what nobody will ever be able to tell you is, is now the best time to sell. You can, you can figure out if it's a bad time to sell or if it's a good time to sell, but you never know if it's the best time to sell. And it ultimately becomes a bit of a judgment call. And it's usually driven by more than the business or more than the capital markets. It's often driven by those things combined with personal objectives and agent stage alike and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, to answer the question, better to prove it out if you can, but you got to be careful that while you're proving it out, you don't you don't lose what's in your favor in, in the part of it you can't control, which is the strength of the capital markets. Yeah, and I, and I just noticed that we have a couple more minutes before we jump into the questions, but Chris, I just wanted to quickly get your thoughts on, you know, kind of looking forward, where do you see the market changing in 22, uh, 2022 as a place to context of acquisitions and financing? Right. So I think by 2022, we're going to see a ton of activity, um, not just with acquisitions, but with resumed growth in new build locations, lots of conversions, renovations, and regular capital needs uh, coming back as we see more stability. Um, you know, the main thing that we're going to start to understand a year from now is how the pandemic has shifted the economic model for restaurants. And, you know, I think this is going to be relevant both, you know, for, for franchisors or brands, as well as for operators. Um, you know, so for brands, consolidation with other systems uh, will make a lot of sense and there may be more needs to get some more economies of scale. Um, in some segments, it's, it may take a couple of years for locations to get back to full sales and profitability as before. And so finding ways for, um, you know, franchisors to help their systems generate savings by optimizing purchasing and other costs in the PL, I think this need is going to bring more transactions to market. Um, and for the next year, I think we're going to see more resales between franchisees increase as well. Um, there were probably expectations at the beginning of the pandemic that larger operators could come in and uh, take over locations of, and get them for a pretty low price. Uh, but businesses have been kept surprisingly liquid uh, with all of these government supports and the need for selling and discounting has not yet occurred. Um, you know, going forward as these subsidies now burn off uh, by fall 2022, if they're not operating as they did before, uh, we'll start to see that pressure that hasn't existed uh, so far uh, with, with selling. So as far as valuations go, I'm actually expecting to see some increases to valuation, um, especially on the QSR side. See, you're probably uh, seeing that now. Um, you know, some purchasers may be willing to pay more for the stability, um, but I think that financial partners are still going to be a bit hesitant to buy into that. Uh, day one until we see cleaner financials to justify that premium. Um, and that and at this point, I think that's probably another 18 to 24 months out. Um, so what that's going to mean from a bank standpoint is that our participation from a loan to cost standpoint may be a bit lower upfront. Uh, so borrowers should you know think about having a bit more equity or maybe structuring a VTB. Uh, just to cover off any gaps between the deal that you want to do and uh, what your financial partner can handle at this point. 
Um, but overall, I think there may be some great reasons to reconsider valuations or lending multiples in the future for some segments. Um, at this point, though, I think lenders will continue just to take a conservative view of the industry as a whole, uh, kind of stick to our knitting of what we know works well through uncertainty and uh, you know swings in the economic cycles. Thank you, Trish. Um, Steve, I wanted to ask you a question uh, about uh, your investments uh, looking forward to 2022, but I, I, I'm going to pause for a second on that to address one of the questions that came through from the audience, if that's okay, and put you on the spot a little bit. Um, you know, just you know, as, you're, as you're out there talking to sellers, as you did, as you're doing, and talking to potential buyers as you, as you did previously when you sold during the pandemic, I mean, who are you bumping into? Who are the, who are the profiles of the, of the community out there? Is this strategics, um, kind of big institutional public codes, uh, mainly private capital? Um, where, where, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, I, I, I mean, mostly what I'm seeing is, is the private equity and then the big pub coast. I'm not seeing, um, you know, a lot of independents going out to buy other things uh, with the conversations I'm having, because most of the conversations I'm having are with, actually all the conversations I'm having are with uh, little companies, you know, not the onesies, twosies. Um, and I think that if, you know, if I was out there buying one restaurant at a time or looking to buy one QSR uh, franchise at a time, uh, then I'd probably run into that, but in the in the groups that I'm looking at, it really is private equity, uh, like big private equity, I would say, and then uh, and the the pub codes that are, you know, similar to me but bigger. And maybe Trish and, and, and uh, Paul just you know, share this one. Also, a question from the audience. You know, is there? And Trish, you actually kind of comment on this a little bit uh, in your prior chat, but. You know, is there a particular segment of the industry or geography that's really kind of hot or that you expect to be hot? Um, you know, is it rural? Is it urban? Is it uh, you know, big box uh, kind of, uh, strip malls? Um, you know, what, what, are you, what are you thinking in terms of what's going to happen there? Yeah, so I think just people will be looking for stability and that has come from a variety of different places. Um, you know, provincially, BC has been, you know, pretty stable. Alberta, generally pretty stable. Ontario, Quebec, not so much. Um, you know, geographies are going to play a big factor into investment decisions. And even, you know, tertiary markets uh, ended up being surprisingly stable in a lot of segments. So I think that's going to just shift the whole valuation model of, of what people uh, will be comfortable investing in, in going forward. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, sure. yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, like I agree with everything that, that, that Trish said. I, I would just add that I think it's going to be, it, you know, there'll be certain segments and geographies that benefit or, or recover more quickly from an M&A perspective. I, I think it's going to come back to what Steve touched on earlier, which is the quality of the brand, the quality of the concept. Um, that always, you know, and that's sometimes tied to geography, but that's always what attracts investor attention. And so I think the best way to think of it is if I have a quality brand and my concept is well developed and I have the right delivery model coming out of into the new normal that we're going to be moving into, you know, that'll drive investor activity one way or the other, regardless where you are, I think. Uh, and just one last question before we jump off and, and this has been great guys. Thank you. Just the question that came through is, you know, are U.S. global brands and concepts coming to Canada? Or are they avoiding our marketplace? Um, you know, the, the example is Fred is locating with AW, a W, recent example. So, uh, you know, just if you could just touch on that briefly, uh, what you're seeing out there in the marketplace. I don't know if, if Steve, if you're closest to that on the brand side, but um, throw it out for the, uh, the panel. Uh, yeah, I'm, I think I have li limited exposure. I mean, um, we all know Wingstop is coming. They're a really big company, as we all know, and they've got plans uh, to open 100 stores with a, a private equity firm here. Uh, there's still a lot of brands in the States that haven't made their way into Canada yet. I, I don't know 
if during the pandemic it was the time to start making those moves if there's more about you know trying to figure out what the next 12 months looks like uh the, there still is re there still is room in the canadian market for more restaurants and more restaurant groups especially after a pandemic where we know uh, you know restaurants canada says that there's 10,000 stores that are closed and will not open and i think there's a bunch in limbo that are closed in you know things like universities and whatnot that they don't know if we're going to open so that number could be as high as thirty thousand. uh just to get back to 2019 numbers that would mean there's thirty thousand restaurant spaces for lease uh so there is room um but i just haven't seen a lot of it uh but maybe i'm not as close to it as some other people well thank you know, we're running out of time so we'll leave it there um paul steve and trish this has been very informative and insightful. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I will now turn it back over to Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mickey. Uh, thank you to all our panelists today. Um, it's clear there's there's not yet a ton of M&A activity in the market, but it does seem like a lot of discussions are occurring and, and, and with, with buyers and sellers, uh, both large aggregators uh, and smaller groups alike uh, and more importantly they, they they are active and they have the capital to spend so that'll likely lead to a greater need for structured lending so it'll definitely be interesting to see uh, what unfolds in the coming months and years so thanks again uh, to the panel for the input on the subject uh, very very appreciated uh, so that essentially wraps up today's presentations a uh, reminder that the exhibit hall and networking area are open all week. Uh, so stop by and check out the sponsors and partner profiles and uh, connect with fellow attendees in the networking area. Uh, we have two final sessions uh, scheduled for tomorrow and the first one will kick off at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So again, thank you, Mickey, Trish, Steve, Paul, for joining us today. Uh, again, thank you to all our sponsors uh, and thank you, our audience, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow.